Hello everyone, it's Takuya here and welcome back to the History of Everything podcast YouTube channel and what the hell is going on in the United States? And also, what the hell are you doing climbing onto me as soon as I try to make a video? Hmm? Hmm? I am sure that a lot of the people that are watching this right now have been watching the news for the past week or so and things are getting very interesting. I mean... It feels like every single week that I am trying to open up and now talk about something, some new kind of big major development in some aspect of the world is just blowing up. Whistleblower tells Congress that the U.S. is concealing a multi-decade program that captures UFOs. I'm sorry, what? I'm sure that a lot of the images that you're seeing on this from this little video that I'm running through right now may seem somewhat familiar because clips and scenes of this have been going viral all across the internet, especially in places like TikTok. But short form content is not going to be able to do justice for this massive story that we're going to need to be talking about. Or I say massive, but is it really as big as what people on the internet are saying that it is? Well, let's dive into it. It does not necessarily matter what kind of article that I'm going to be pulling all of this from because many of them are saying essentially the same kind of thing. That according to a former Air Force intelligence officer that testified on Wednesday to Congress, the U.S. is concealing a long-standing program that retrieves and reverse engineers unidentified flying objects. Of course, the entire time, the Pentagon has naturally denied these claims and says that it's, just, it's not true. But all this is coming from retired Major David Grush's highly anticipated testimony before a House Oversight Subcommittee, and this was Congress's latest foray into the world of UAPs, or Unidentified Aerial Phenomena, which that whole thing with UAPs is rather interesting because back in the uh, the 1900s, like the late 1900s, they transitioned from calling things UFOs to UAPs because they wanted to remove a lot of the baggage that is associated with UFOs or unidentified flying objects. And it's natural from over the years association with aliens. Yeah, UAPs are the official term that the U.S. government uses instead of UFOs. And while the study of mysterious aircraft or objects often evokes talks of aliens and little green men, Democrats and Republicans in recent years have pushed for more research as a national security matter due to concerns that sightings observed by pilots may be tied to U.S. adversaries. And I suppose that is the crux of exactly what it is that we're going to be talking about. National security and history as it relates to possibilities of foreign adversaries rather than aliens. Of course, of course, that is not exactly what the internet is hearing nowadays, but hey, that's one of the reasons why we're diving into this in the first place. So Grush had said that he was asked in 2019 by the head of a government task force on UAPs to identify all highly classified programs relating to the task force mission. At the time, Grush was detailed to the National Reconnaissance Office, which is the agency that is the thing that is in charge of United States spy satellites. The statement that he gave regarding this was, and I quote, I was informed in the course of my official duties of a multi-decade UAP crash retrieval and reverse engineering program to which I was denied access, he says. Which I will say here from the very beginning seems kind of interesting that he was given the information about it, but then simultaneously denied access. That just seems a little bit odd in the first place. But who knows? Maybe what I'm saying right now is just completely full of it. But th that, that just seems weird according to what I'm seeing right there. And when he was asked whether the U.S. government had information about extraterrestrial life, Grush said that the U.S. had likely been aware of non-human activity since the 1930s. Which seems like a big deal, but one of the things that has been happening over the internet is that people have essentially been making a joke out of this. It, it hasn't caused nearly as much of a stir as what you probably would have anticipated, because, well, A, none of it is necessarily confirmed, and B, people are running it into jokes saying, oh yeah, alien confirmed 100%, when that's not really the case. And also, you have to remember that everything is kind of up in the air because the Pentagon has denied Grush's claims of a cover-up. And in a statement, the Defense Department spokeswoman, Sue Go has said that investigators have not discovered any verifiable information to substantiate claims that any programs regarding the possession or reverse engineering of extraterrestrial materials have existed in the past or exist currently. In other words, the entire thing is a complete, flat-out denial that any such program exists or has ever existed in the first place. But I suppose the interesting thing to note about these statements is that while they are denying things on the extraterrestrial side of things, i.e. aliens, it's not necessarily denying that there are programs that the United States has in order to try and capture foreign tech, as in that is still on this earth, but from possible hostile countries in order to reverse engineer that. It's just the language that they're talking about is outright denying anything to do with aliens, which makes sense. But Grush doesn't exactly believe that. According to Grush, he says that he became a government whistleblower after his discovery and has faced retaliation for coming forward. However, we don't exactly know how it is that he has faced retaliation. He hasn't been very specific with the things that he has faced, so we don't really know what exactly has been happening there. 
Like we can't say for certain what exactly retaliatory tactics have occurred. And he cites the fact that with it being an ongoing investigation, that this information can't be revealed yet. So I don't know. But he says, and I quote, that it was very brutal and very unfortunate. Some of the tactics they used to hurt me both professionally and personally, he said. So, okay, the language that we're using to describe this entire thing is rather vague, as I'm pretty sure you all can already get by now. So what exactly is going on? How are the people reacting to all? of this. Well, I don't know whether or not necessarily everyone is taking it as seriously as some are, but as an example of this, the guy who is chairing the entire thing, Representative Glenn Grothman, the Republican from Wisconsin, he turned around and made a joke to the audience of it saying, hey, welcome to the most exciting subcommittee in Congress this week, which I guess, yeah, it kind of is. Everyone is interested in this subcommittee, even if not nearly as many people are taking it as seriously as it possibly is, but we can't really say any of that for certain. There is bipartisan interest in Grush's claim, and there's more of a sober tone regarding this entire thing because of other recent hearings involving whistleblowers. Even if absolutely nothing comes from all of this, the thing that both sides are taking from it is more of a call for transparency within Congress and within aspects of the government than anything else. And over the course of it, some lawmakers have criticized the Pentagon for not providing more details in a classified briefing or in releasing images that are able to be shown to the public. And I suppose there is a reason as to why that is the case. And I suppose it all really does make sense because Pentagon officials back in December had said that they've received several hundred new reports since launching a renewed effort in order to try and investigate reports of UFOs. Which, in case you're curious about that last part, I'm going to go ahead and explain that for just a second because this really has been a big development for the past two or three years within the United States. Back in July of 2022, there was something called the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, or AARO, that was set up, and this is responsible for not only tracking unidentified objects in the sky, but also anything that was underwater or in space or really any kind of potential object that has the ability to move from, quote, one domain to the next, it's able to transport itself, and is something that therefore needs to be tracked. This is an office that was established following more than a year of attention on unidentified flying objects that military pilots have been observing for the past couple years, but haven't really wanted to report them because, well, you know, that, that could be something that could be seen as, as kind of off. You don't want a pilot who's just seeing things in the sky. So we go back a year, and in June of 2021, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence reported that between the year 2004 and 2021, there were 144 different encounters here that were reported, 80 of which were captured on multiple types of sensors, not just the size of a pilot or anything like that. Now, I'm going to tell you this right now, but this is not an office that was set up with the explicit purpose of exploring things for extraterrestrial life. Rather, this was something that was set up in order to be able to analyze the security risks that were posed by so many different encounters, considering that the things that were discovering them, that were finding these objects, were all military installations and military aircraft, and you don't want America's enemies to potentially be able to get information on those. The idea of all of this, of course, is that it doesn't even really matter as to whether or not an object is extraterrestrial in origin or whether or not it belongs to China or Russia or any one of America's adversaries. Either way, it is something that is going to pose some type of security risk, and that is what they are really focusing in on. Which I'm just going to say this right now, that is definitely a very valid concern considering everything that we have seen over the past year or two. I mean, just remember at the beginning of 2023, the Chinese balloon spy incident. For anyone who wasn't paying attention or may need a refresher on this matter, I'm going to kind of briefly explain it. But what I am talking about is that from January 28th to February 4th of 2023, there was a high altitude balloon that was owned by China and was spotted in North American airspace. This is something that was going over Alaska, over Western Canada, and all across the United States. After days of trying to figure out what exactly was going on, on February 4th, the United States Air Force then shot down the balloon over U.S. territorial waters off the coast of South Carolina. Debris of the wreckage was then collected by the FBI in order to analyze it and see what was going on with it. And then following a preliminary analysis of the balloon in June of this year, U.S. officials then said that it looks like the balloon was filled with spy equipment, specifically in order to capture information about the United States. That all being said, it doesn't look like any of the information that it was collecting, it was actually able to send back to China, so they were able to get it before it could do anything. So in other words, the United States' concerns with UFOs are real. They definitely are real and valid, 
but, and this is a very big but, I might add, any of the short videos or the over-the-top headlines or anything that you are seeing saying that, oh, the government admits that aliens are real, aliens confirmed 100%, well, these are simply not true and are there in order to try and get clicks from you, the viewer. That is the reality of the situation. And from all of this, I am not telling you that aliens do not exist. That is not the case at all. In my personal opinion, believing that we are simply alone in the galaxy is a stupidly unlikely thing. I don't think that is the case. But I have to say this once again, we do not have any definitive proof of the matter. We, just, we really don't. And there are simply far too many times in history where there are significantly more reasonable or just honestly funny explanations as to what exactly is going on. UFO sightings are something that have been going on for not just decades, but almost a century at this point. And that right there is where the history part of this video really does come in. Because guys, when I was going and doing the research for this video, even though I had some of the cursory knowledge already about it, even I was shocked with the sheer amount of the number of similar incidents that have occurred in the past that is kind of similar to what we're seeing here today. And so I wanted to show you some of the history of these uh, UFO sightings and how exactly everything played out. Which first off, we're going to need to start at the beginning in order to try and understand how UFOs even capture the public's mind and interest and everything in the first place. The gist of it is that in the first place, when we are talking about UFOs, people have been seeing intriguing or confounding objects in the sky for as long as humans have existed on this earth. That's just the, the way of things in the first place. Over the eons, for example, many different cultures all across the world have regarded meteors and comets and things like that in the sky as things that were supernatural in nature. Oftentimes, these dramatic skylights were seen as a sign of some deity's displeasure or a sign of something great or terrible to come. An example of this, if we go back around a thousand years, is in the 11th century Bayeux Tapestry, which chronicles the events leading up to the Norman conquest of England in 1066. You may not be able to recognize it immediately, but the image that you can see behind me here is actually representation of Halley's Comet. This is the famous comet that would zoom through the inner solar system that same year, and the 230-foot-long tapestry depicts it ominously over King Harold's head. The idea of it, as that people were viewing it, is that the comet was a sign of some kind of evil omen, that something terrible was about to happen, specifically to the king. And then as the news of the comet is brought to the king, beneath the king's image, you can see ghostly ship images, a sign of an army that is coming to invade and take over the land, i.e. the Norm. That, that's what that's referring to. Harold was ultimately killed by William the Conqueror's troops during the decisive Battle of Hastings, and from there we have the birth of modern England, as we would call it. But that really is just one example of what I'm talking about. Nowadays, we don't necessarily really think much of comets as being UFOs, but the UFO phenomenon as we know it today is a very recent invention, something that has specifically come about because of military hardware and how it has changed over the years. It's something that really only became possible thanks to the power of flight itself. Which makes sense, there really wasn't as many flying objects for people over a thousand years ago to be puzzled by, unless they were just exceptionally large birds or anything like that. The point in which UFOs took off was really during and after World War II, this being when Allied pilots in both the European and the Pacific threads reported seeing all different kinds of puzzling lights or objects in the sky. Of course, as we know now, there were many different nations that at the time were experimenting with new types of tech in order to be able to use them in order to defeat their enemies, but for the pilots at the time viewing this stuff, a lot of it was classified and they would have never actually seen any of this happening or heard any reports. It was all new, but all that military tech and experimentations we're going to be getting into in just a second. Where aliens get involved in the story, well, that, that, that needs to be talked about first. Because then in June of 1947, there was an American businessman and aviator by the name of Kenneth Arnold, who reported seeing nine shiny, mysterious craft zipping through the skies near Washington's Mount Rainer. Some of the newspaper stories that were describing these UFOs would deem them to be flying saucers or flying discs based off the shape of what the reports were saying. And that term of something being a flying saucer, well, that is something that would stick with the public for many, many more years after. After all of this went down and people started to take notice of what was happening, UFO reports surged all across the country in the wake of Arnold's sightings, with some of them winding up on pages of major news sources like the New York Times. With one of the items that the Times picking up was the seemingly exotic wreckage of some kind of craft on a ranch in Lincoln County, New Mexico back in the year 1947. Sightings were appearing everywhere at this point, but the big one was yet to come. I'm sure that a lot of you who are already watching this are somewhat aware of the Roswell incident, but for those of you who aren't, I'm going to explain this briefly. You see, in July of that year, there was a public information officer at the relatively nearby Roswell Army airfield that described having debris as a flying saucer, which ignited a bit of a fire 
firestorm and confused anyone that heard this. Army officials then moved in quickly in order to retract the statement, explaining that the material that they had in question was the remains of a crashed weather balloon, not any kind of flying saucer with alien life. And it was after that that the Roswell incident, as it was at the moment, kind of faded back into obscurity. Nothing else really came of it for a while. It didn't stay quiet forever, though, because it would come roaring back around three decades later when it was revived by UFO enthusiasts who claimed that what had happened is that the U.S. government had actually found an alien spacecraft there in New Mexico, perhaps something that even had extraterrestrial life inside of it, and then just decided to go ahead and cover the entire thing up. Some conspiracists believe that the wreckage was spirited away to a hush-hush military site called Area 51, which to this day on the internet lives as a kind of meme. I'm sure that a lot of us are already familiar with that one incident, what was it, last year or was it the year before? It's almost kind of all blurring together here now. But there was that whole incident with Rush Area 51, and I just, God, do I, I, I feel like I want to do a whole episode just on that because of how ridiculous that entire thing is and the story behind it. But yeah, a whole bunch of people gathered from across the United States in Area 51 with the goal after a Facebook group announced to rush Area 51 and clap them alien cheeks. Yeah, I don't even know how to begin to describe that. But either way, conspiracists believe to this day that inside of Area 1, there is still the bodies of former alien pilots and also wreckage of alien craft that is being studied by the U.S. government. But if we go and remove the alien component out of the question entirely, there's still the reality that the U.S. military is concerned with UFOs, and it has been since the 1940s. And so as soon as all of these reports started to come out in the 1940s and 50s, the United States government began to investigate each one of them relatively seriously. So what ended up happening is that the Air Force went and established Project Sign to this end in 1947, and that was followed up with the similarly short-lived Project Grudge in 1948. The one that we're more familiar with that came after, though, was Project Blue Book. And this is something that started in the year 1952 and went all the way to the year 1969. Over the course of that time, the U.S. government would investigate for the 12,600 UFO sightings. And being over the span of 17 years, that is quite a lot. Like, if we just wanted to stop here for a second and do the math, we're talking about 17 years times 365 days, meaning if there was 6,200 sightings, that would be a sighting every single day. With it being 12,600, we're talking about a case where there were at least two sightings of UFOs every single day for 17 years that the government had to investigate during that time, which is a lot. One of the sightings that Project Blue Book would actually go and investigate was that of Betty and Barney Hill, who claimed that they were captured and examined by extraterrestrials in rural New Hampshire in September of 1961. The couple's account was then picked up by newspapers in the year 1965, and this became the first ever widely publicized alien abduction story in American history. If we were going to do an analysis on it, that is probably something that would be its own interesting story, but I digress. There's a lot more things in here that we're going to need to talk about right now. If you all do want to see stuff like that, then you better let me know down in the comment section below after like liking, commenting, and subscribing. Of course, even though we're talking about things with Project Blue Book, UFO sightings would not end when that project itself would end in 1969. No, over the years, they would just keep on rolling in as the decades would pass. One of the more famous ones to occur in the past half century was that of Travis Walton, who's an Arizona man whose 1975 alien abduction claim ended up being dramatized in a 1993 film called Fire in the Sky. Another one was the Rendlesham Forest incident, in which there was a string of mysterious observations near England's Royal Air Force Woodbridge Station in December of 1980. And then there's the Phoenix Lights, which confused a whole lot of people in Arizona in March of 1997. There were quite a number of these involving civilians, but there even continued to be stuff that involved the military for years afterwards. If we go back to November of 2004, there were a series of several U.S. Navy pilots that were flying off the coast of San Diego, and they reported seeing bizarre aircraft just zooming through the sky. The way that they moved, they described as being something that wasn't possible with the technology of the day. Like, there's no way that these crafts should have been capable of doing anything like that. And then around a decade later, from June 2014 to March 2015, there were other U.S. Navy pilots over on the east side of the country who reported similar observations. The pilots who were observing all of this captured infrared video of some of these encounters using their onboard camera systems. 
And then three of these videos that the New York Times ended up publishing went viral back in the year 2017, spreading awareness of it throughout the public. The entire thing was part of a blockbuster story about a previously secret military UFO investigating effort called the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, or the AATIP for short. In short, what it is that I'm trying to say is that there have been UFO sightings for many, many years, but typically speaking, there are explanations behind them for what was really going on. And oftentimes these explanations are significantly more mundane than most people on the internet would rather wish, but that's kind of the reality of how things typically go. And let me explain what it is that I mean. By definition, when we are talking about a UFO, that is a unidentified flying object. As the U of unidentified means, that whole thing is unknown. You can't have something that we know what it is and it still be a UFO. That is why people love to speculate about what exactly strange lights or objects or anything in the sky could be, because the possibilities seem to be endless at the time. But just because an airborne object is mysterious does not mean that it is extraterrestrial in nature. After all, if you have an airplane that doesn't announce itself, well, that means that that airplane in the sky picked up by any kind of sensors is a UFO. It's an unidentified flying object. So on that note, what I'm going to do now is talk about some UFOs that definitely did cause a stir, but simultaneously were definitely from our planet still. Like, okay, first one up on this list, we have to talk about the SR-71 Blackbird. And I'm going to use some footage of this thing because it's just so incredibly cool. So please, for the love of God, I hope this doesn't cause any issues right now. The SR-71 Blackbird is an extremely famous plane in the U.S. arsenal. Something that was born out of Lockheed Martin's famous yet secretive Skunk Works division. You have to understand just how incredibly and stupidly fast this thing is. The Blackbird is the fastest air-breathing jet aircraft to ever fly. It is something that is capable of flying at around 2,200 miles per hour or Mach 3. This is a thing that is capable of making it from London to the city of New York in just under around two hours. The aircraft is a testament to the extreme measures that the United States was willing to take during the Cold War and just the sheer amount of technological advancement that it could muster. This may have been a war plane, but it was not a fighter plane. The entire purpose of it was reconnaissance. Specifically, the mission that it had was to fly in to a location, take pictures, and then get out of there as soon as possible. The thing was so incredibly stupidly fast that missiles just couldn't catch up to it. And as you could probably see from its more sci-fi appearance, this thing would go on to inspire a lot of other stuff in our own sci-fi and culture. Like as an example, the thing that you can see right here, the jet from the X-Men series, yeah, that is direct inspiration from the Blackbird. Or if you go and look at the spacecraft for Queen Amidala from Star Wars, yeah, that also taken from the Blackbird. So guys, I'm just saying, imagine if you will, that you are a casual movie fan or just a person in the 60s or 70s that observes something streaking across the sky as a large black mass. Something that was going at unbelievable speeds that nothing should be capable of going and simultaneously there's no word from your government or anyone for, you know, what you have been able to create. You're probably going to think that this is something from out of this world too and many observations of the Blackbird would precisely be just that. They would be reported as UFO sightings. The second thing that we're going to be talking about on this list is the Lockheed F-117, which was the first operational aircraft that was built entirely around stealth technology. Now you can see this from the variety of pictures that are behind me right now, but the Lockheed F-117 Nighthawk is not something that looks conventional at all. Like, this does not look like a standard plane. And that's, of course, for very good reason. The design of the body is characterized by sharp angles as well as a low aspect ratio. What that means is that in comparison to a standard plane, the size of the wings in relation to the body are significantly smaller. And because this aircraft had such an incredibly strange shape, this meant that it was able to deflect and absorb radar signals, something that meant that the plane was essentially going to become a invisible to any of the high-tech systems that enemies would be used in order to try and detect it. And naturally, because this thing was meant to fly undetected and because it was new technology, the development of this thing was a really big secret. Nothing about this aircraft was supposed to be known by the public at all. So after one of the aircraft ended up crashing in a remote mountainous area outside of Bakersfield, California in 1986, the Air Force then had to rush in and close the site down so that no one could actually get access to it. According to the Los Angeles Times, at the time, the Air Force then deemed it to be a national security area. But of course, we've been spending this entire episode talking about UFOs, so you can probably imagine how the public in the 80s is going to be reacting to this information. Yeah, naturally speaking, the people are going to think that the whole thing is a cover-up and that aliens secretly crashed into California and the government is trying to take the technology from it. So much of a stink and speculation was raised over this thing that eventually the government ended up being forced to reveal what it is that happened in 1988, and the public was finally then introduced to the F-117 in probably one of the worst ways possible. But 
But that is just one example of technology going bad and creating a stink. There was a whole other incident that occurred in Norway in 2009, and uh, yeah, that that um, that's Russia's fault. Which, what I'm going to be talking about next, I honestly just find kind of hilarious considering what has been going on with the Russo-Ukrainian conflict today and Russian technology and reliability. So for that, I actually went up here and I'm pulling up an article directly from 2009 when it all happened. New Russian missile failure sparks UFO frenzy. So yeah, back in the year 2009, Russia's new nuclear-capable missile suffered another failed test launch, the defense ministry said Thursday, involving the mystery of a spectacular plume of white light that appeared over Norway. The Bulava missile was test-fired from the submarine Dmitry Donskoy in the White Sea early Wednesday, but failed at the third stage, the defense ministry said in a statement. The pre-dawn morning launch coincided with the appearance of an extraordinary light over northern Norway that captivated observers. Which, yeah, just give me a second. Let's see if I can actually pull up a video of this exact thing happening. Like, here we have some old news footage of what it is that I'm talking about, but you can see how exactly confusing this is. We have a spiral that is going in the sky, and for anyone observing this, in comparison to just a standard streak of light, that is insane because it looks like a light hurricane that is going across the sky. That is incredibly interesting. So naturally, for anyone looking at this, they're going to be very confused, and many of them are going to think that this is a UFO. It looks like it is something that is alien. Why is this spiraling? Why is it creating this kind of pattern? Well, the answer is something that is really funny and stupid, to be honest. Describing the latest failure of the Balaba as a major embarrassment for the military, leading Russian defense analyst Pavel Felengauer said that the images were consistent with a missile failure. Such lights and clouds appear from time to time when a missile fails in the upper layers of the atmosphere and have been reported before. So in other words, as the missile was going up into the air, uh, it failed and began to spin wildly and out of control. And that spinning action over and over and over again as it's thrusting is creating a screen that looks like a spiral cloud across the sky. At least the failed test made some nice fireworks for the Norwegians, he joked. I just really wanted to bring this one up because considering, again, everything that is going on in Ukraine with Russian technology right now, it's just, it's so funny because then you see statements like this that say, by the year 2030, Russia could lose its position as a global nuclear power if the problems that it has with its technology are not solved. And it could be these missiles that never fly properly. Honestly, the, the, the entire thing for this is just hilarious. It's just hilarious in my opinion. But either way, everything that I've listed here at this point is something that involves classified technology. But oftentimes, things are significantly more simple than any of that, and it still confuses people to this day, such as with things like balloons. And no, I'm not talking about just things with Chinese spy balloons. I mean, even before that, with things that are significantly more simple. The final incident that I'm going to be talking about took place back in the year 2010, where on October 13th, hundreds of people that were in Manhattan's Chelsea neighborhood saw a cluster of silver-like objects in the sky that were shiny and glittering and seemed to be high above what anything should be capable of. And because so many different people were observing this from different angles, different people saw different things, as you can naturally expect, which led to a lot of speculation about what type of UFO this was. Some people thought that they saw one large slow-moving object, others thought that they saw several objects moving rapidly across the sky, and the fact that these objects were strange and shimmering and seemed to change shape in the sky definitely did not help the situation. As it turns out, what actually happened was that the strange shimmering lights turned out to be caused by 12 helium balloons that escaped from an engagement party that was being held for a teacher at the Milestone School in Mount Vernon. This is something that was in Westchester County, only around 15 miles away, and the balloons had been inadvertently released at 1 p.m., with the first UFO sightings coming in around 1.30 p.m., very closely and immediately after. And that's really it for that. Look, guys, in the end, I'm going to simply say this. Nothing that I have talked about over the course of this video is evidence or arguments against the existence of alien life. That is simply not the case. The only thing that I really wanted to do with this is that I wanted to really dive into the history of UFO sightings and how exactly it has worked within the United States. In fact, I've only really approached things within the United States. There were many other sightings and circumstances for people all over the world that, well, may have different stories than what it is that I'm talking about here today. But right now, there are simply way too many people on the internet that are doing one of two extremes. They're either just turning the thing into an entire joke whatsoever, or simultaneously, they are treating it as though this is 100% confirmation that we have discovered aliens, that aliens are confirmed by Congress, and all of that is simply not true. If there are any other updates or developments or anything that occurs with the story, you can be sure that I'm going to be talking about it, because I may be a history guy, but what we are talking about here, if there actually is confirmation of alien life, if that is something that does happen, if there is a big cover 
up, if anything like that does occur, you can bet that at that moment, that is a monumental thing in history that will need to be documented. So naturally, of course, I'm going to be talking about it at the time. But right now, there just really isn't anything. So please... For anyone watching this, don't let yourself get misled by stuff on the internet. It is very easy for stuff like that to happen. But that all being said, this has been Stockuyi with the History of Everything podcast YouTube channel. Thank you everyone very much for watching. I really do appreciate all of you. Some announcements before we go ahead and end the video here today. There is still one early bird spot left for our trip that we're going to be taking this next May to Italy. So if you'd like to take that and get the $100 discount, then by all means, please do sign up down in the description below. It's going to be a lot of fun. And once we get that 12th person, the trip is confirmed. Simultaneously, if you'd like to support this channel and you want to get some really good tasting coffee, then make sure to check out the description for my coffee product below. As you can imagine from the history jokes that I have to put in here, it is Lewis and Dark, not Lewis and Clark, and is some rich, chocolatey, delicious coffee that I personally love. Simultaneously, over the course of this week, we're going to be revamping how things work with Patreon, and we're also planning on launching YouTube memberships here, and we're going to really figure out how to balance that in order to give people the most bang for their buck. So if there's any way that you want to support me, I really do greatly appreciate it, or if not from any of this, if you simply want to continue to watch the videos, to like, comment, subscribe, do everything you can like that to help give some interaction to the video itself, the longer you watch and the more that you do, the more that it does help me. So for all of that, for all of you, I really do appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. And I hope you all have a good rest of your day. Goodbye, guys.